we, uh, we have a really tight, well-oiled uh, um, presentation, presentation yeah. for you tonight. Yeah, every second will, is accounted for, yeah. pretty much. Yeah. You know? it's, it's all scripted. So um, where are we starting? Okay. Well, we're going to start with how we met. Well, first of all, what we do for a living it, it provides you with wonderful opportunities to um, meet the people that um, you've admired, you know. And then if you're lucky, you get to work with them. And if you're even luckier, you get to be friends with them. So I can't imagine how thrilled you are to be on stage yeah. say right now. <laughs> no, I mean, I've known about Dave Barry, my God, my whole life. I remember I was a little boy, maybe five, six. <laughs> My grandfather used to say to me, uh, he read to me about, you know, you know, colonoscopy. Because Alan can't and, read. And then right. whatever. No, I mean, we met in Washington, D.C., right? Yep. Uh, Steve Martin was being honored, right, yep. with the Mark Twain Award. And uh, Dave spoke at the, uh, at the reception. And I was there because Larry David also spoke, and I helped Larry write his speech. And Larry said, you're coming down to me, uh, Washington with me, right? Right, right. I go, yeah, okay, I'll go with you to Washington. So my wife, Robin, and I went to Washington, and the show was at the Kennedy Center. And afterwards, there was an after party, and I saw you. And um, I think we have different versions as to what exactly happened. <laughs> what, what do you remember about the encounter? I just remember you licking my shoe. <laughs> but, in a, but not in a, you know, in a demeaning way. I guess we both have the same account of <laughs> recollection of it. Um, no, we started uh, talking and communicating, and then we'd see each other on our own uh, respective book tours, and then our wives met, and we just became friends. And then one day, I called him and I said, why don't we write a book together, right? Yep. And uh, he said, what kind of book? And I said, a novel. <laughs> he said, I'd like to remind you that I live in, he lives in Carl Gables, Florida and I lived in Short Hills, New Jersey, and it was 1,500 miles apart, and said, how are we going to do this? How did we do this, by the way? We used the internet, Alan. It, right. It was, even, that, even, that, even in New Jersey, they have it. And <laughs> so we, we wrote a book together um, called Lunatics, and I was not pausing for the smattering of <laughs> If I was going to pause, I would expect a lot more applause <laughs> than that. No, it's for a smatter. So, <laughs> so, um, so we, we wrote this book, and we did not have, uh, what do you call them? A, we did not have a plot. Uh, a lot of people, apparently, they have a plot ahead of time. Before overrated. Start, yeah. It's just <laughs> overrated. But we didn't have that. We just had this very sketchy idea of two dads at a soccer match, a kid's soccer match, who get into an argument that escalates and eventually almost results in a world war. Um, and um, the thing I remember was, we, you know, you kind of wait, you'd send your, we did it by alternating chapters. And um, at about, I'd say, a quarter of the way through the book, uh, Alan sent me a chapter and I read it, and, I, and I, I think I actually called him up. And I said, and this is, I don't want to get technical. So, you know, inside literary baseball here. But he killed all the main characters. <laughs> one, you, one quarter of the way into the book. I, I, I had lost sight of the fact that if four people jump off of an ocean liner <laughs> right. into the choppy sea below. They're probably not going to make it. They're probably not going to make it, yeah. yeah. So, um, so, so I revised it. So uh, <laughs> then that was the beauty. And this book came out. Well, we actually had no idea when we should stop writing it until our editor called up and said it's due Thursday. <laughs> 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 He's, oh, shit, we got to figure out how this ends, you know. And uh, we have since written, uh, we wrote another book together. Well, with wait, wait, first we, we went through a, a, a whole movie. This is L.A., we should talk about the movie. Oh, yeah, yeah. The movie deal. We had a movie deal. <laughs> we, had, we had a movie deal with Steve Carell and his company, and Steve would play one of the soccer dads. And um, we sold the rights to it, and um, we started uh, writing a screenplay, right? And every, I'm probably, I'm guessing, 
Anybody in this room not written a screenplay? Uh, okay, just a couple. So every cliche about the, that process is true. Um, and what I remember is Alan is in New Jersey, and I'm in Coral Gables, and we had these um, conference calls with I really don't know who with. <laughs> There's always be like eight voices on the other end. And, you know, you write, we wrote, a, we wrote a script, and, you know, it's kind of, we thought, incorporated all the elements of the plot and everything. It was funny, and we thought. And then there, you hear the eight voices, and everybody has a problem. But they don't say it's a problem. They love it. That's the worst thing you can say. <laughs> we love it. We but, but. And then, you know, they have a lot of suggestions. And then they, we'd hang up off the, the call, and I would call Alan and say, what, what was that? And Alan would, like, because he's been through this many times, would say, don't worry about it. We'll just do this, this, this. So we'd make a whole bunch of changes. Right. Send them in, and then we'd have another conference call when everybody could do it. That usually take about a year to organize because <laughs> everybody's busy. And, um, and they would have more notes, and sometimes the notes would be just exactly what the, the thing originally said <laughs> that we had changed right. to make it... This is the system out here. This is the way it works. <laughs> See, I come from television, and I'm used to this. Yeah. And in the movies, I'm used to this. You wrote your column, and you, I, I imagine you had an editor. Nobody edited me. Okay. <laughs> Why would they do this? Yeah. Okay. But here, you know, I mean, th this happens every day of the week. And that's why writing books is something that I enjoy doing, alone or certainly with you, um, because we're in charge. You know, because I would go into meetings, just like everybody else here who's written a screenplay, all of us, you know, I, I had written a book about me and Gilda Radna called Bunny Bunny, and uh, a, a... That was you. really smart. Yeah. <laughs> that wasn't even we're, a smatter. That we're was gonna a have smack. To, we're going to have to do a little better. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> What was the name of the book? Bunny Bunny. Yeah. And it was about me and my buddy Gilda Radner and um, a certain cable network. I won't mention it, but it begins with H and ends with O. Okay. Just use the initials and then no will. Yeah, that's what it was. Yeah. H, then there's another letter. Oh, I see. Okay. One of the first letters of the alphabet, but not the first one. And then O. And then they bought the uh, movie rights to it, but they said does she have to die at the end? I said, listen, she's got terminal cancer. What is it? Was this a misdiagnosis? I mean, was it a cold? What was it? They said, no, they were thinking about the sequel, okay? Now, so you're, you're making this I'm up. I'm not making this up. But it, it was going to be about Gilda Radner, but she wasn't going to she die. She wasn't going to die, okay? Maybe they were right. I don't know, okay? <laughs> no, but that's the way things go, and sometimes it's just totally arbitrary. I once had a pilot at Fox that I wanted... Um, uh, okay, maybe it wasn't that commercial, because somebody would be playing Eleanor Roosevelt, okay? <laughs> but the president of Fox at the time said, we really like this idea. I think I wrote a script, really liked the script, okay? Um, you know, we have... So Scarlett Johansson is... Oh, oh, oh worse, yeah. was Queen Latifah. <laughs> I said, well, well, wait a second. They said, we just signed her, and she's hot as hell, and uh, she... I said, but Queen Latifah as Eleanor Roosevelt. <laughs> you, you are making... No, I swear to God, I'm not. <laughs> you don't know everything that's happened to me, you know? <laughs> it, it's been very, very tough, you know? <laughs> But so, um, so I'm more used to the <laughs> collaboration. Queen Latifah. Yeah, Queen Latifah. <laughs> I would see her more as Stalin. Well, see, there you go. Yeah. That would have been a great meeting. So we met at the end of the, after Steve Martin's um, uh, Kennedy Center. No, we already thing. passed that. We, so we wrote then, a book. No, I'm just recapping for those people Both who people. just walked in. And then, then <laughs> we, um, so we started writing. We wrote that book together, and we also wrote another book with a guy named Adam Mansback. If you don't know his name, Adam Mansback wrote a children's book about four or five years ago that sold a gazillion copies. It was called Go to Fuck to Sleep. Okay? And if you haven't read it, it's hilarious because parents of young kids give it to each other because that's how you feel. 
And if you want to laugh your ass off, Google it, the audio version, because it's Samuel L. Jackson reading it <laughs> and basically threatening the, you know, to beat they, the they, shit they, out of this kid. They couldn't get Queen Latifah. She yeah, was, they couldn't get Queen Latifah. She was too hot. So that book was a parody of the Haggadah. Right, right? so we wrote a Haggadah, and uh, pe people will sometimes ask why I, because uh, Adam is Jewish and Alan is Jewish. Um, right? I'm right. Yeah, you got it. And, <laughs> but I'm not Jewish. Um, but I, I am married to a Jewish woman, Juban, actually, Cuban Jewish. They call it, that's what they call them. So they didn't, they didn't come on rafts, they parted the Caribbean. And, <laughs> and not only is um, my wife Jewish, my, my son married a, a Jewish woman as well. And, um, and I, I, I belong to a temple. I'm not, again, I, I didn't convert or anything, but it's a very, there's like orthodox, conservative reform, and then there's relaxed. And there's not, <laughs> my temple is, is relaxed. Um, and the couple things about Judaism that I, I, many things I like, the one, the one thing that's a little strange to me is, like, I, I, well, I was raised in the Episcopalian faith, and the way they work it is, once a week you go to church for one hour. And that's it. It's like, you know, you, every Sunday and for one hour. And, and Judaism, nobody goes, nobody goes, nobody goes. And then all of a sudden, out of the blue, <laughs> on a random Tuesday, <laughs> they have something called like Harish Kadoma or something like that. <laughs> and you have to go for 83 hours straight <laughs> to the temple. <laughs> So that, that's a little weird. And the other thing is, um, I have a bone to pick with the Jewish faith about the bris. And this is where my, my son is involved. My son and his wife had a, had a son. Uh, and so um, they had to have a bris. And for those, I imagine everyone here is Jewish, of course. But <laughs> if you're not, a bris, on the eighth day of a male Jewish child's life, he is circumcised in front of family and friends, and then there's a deli platter. <laughs> Sometimes on the same surface. And, <laughs> and I've been to Briss's, and I've never been like really comfortable with it. You know, like, I just look away. And, and, but when my, my uh, grandson was born, my son and daughter-in-law asked me to be the Sondek, uh, which is the name of the guy. This is supposed to be a big honor. The person who holds the baby while the moil, which is the Hebrew word for snipper, um, <laughs> does that. And so I had to, this was no way I could look away. It was going to be a close range to this. And so I, because I was asked to be the Sondek, I, I thought I'm going to look up, you know, uh, you know, what is the meaning? Why do they do this? Why do the Jews do this? And it's very clear if I, you go to the Old Testament, uh, which is um, on the internet. Uh, <laughs> you know, they had it back then, but there it is. And, and um, it's there, when Abraham, the patriarch of the Jewish people, is 99 years old, he's 99 years old, God comes to him, uh, which is never a good thing in the Old Testament. It's like... <laughs> God never comes for a fun reason, you know. He, he says, hey, I just turned a whole black sea into beer. Go now, it's like, it's always something bad. You have to smite somebody, or you have to build an ark or something. And he goes to Abraham and says, you are going to be the patriarch of a great tribe of people, and um, you're going to have many, many, you know, offspring, and you're going to get the land of Canaan, which is the biblical term for what we now call Long Island. And... <laughs> But to seal the deal as a token of the covenant, um, you have to circumcise yourself and all of your male, uh, males in your family forever more. This is a 99-year-old man. You know, like, why, why couldn't God just shake hands with him? You know? <laughs> and the thing is, like shaking hands, imagine if you're in the family of Abraham and he comes out with a knife. <laughs> said, I just talked to God. Guess, guess what, you know? So, anyway, that's how Jewish I am. Uh, but I did, I did hold, I did hold Dylan Maxwell Berry in, in my arms while the Moyle did his thing, and, and uh, he took it like a man. 
Well, I cried like a, a baby, but he, he handled pretty well. As a Jew, I take a little offense. Um, <laughs> I, was, I was brought up steeped in this tradition, you know, and uh, even when I started writing, that's what I wrote about. I started, um, when I wrote for guys who wrote, uh, worked in the Catskill Mountains, I wrote jokes for $7 a joke. That was the going rate at the time. And um, what's that? Oh, I, so um, do you want to hear a $7 joke? Yes, of course. <laughs> First joke I ever wrote for $7, I got a phone call from a Catskill comedian. I'm 21 years old. I'm living with my parents. And he says, Alan, sperm banks are in the news. I said, OK. He said, can you write me any sperm bank jokes? So I wrote a joke that I got $7 for, that they have a new thing now called sperm banks which is just like an ordinary bank, except here, after you make a deposit, you lose interest, OK? <laughs> so, but the reason I mentioned the Jewish people, because, because of the weight and, and the success of that sperm bank joke, my price went up to $10, then $12. The highest I ever got for one joke was $18. I had gotten chai for a joke <laughs> about a Hasidic orgy, which was very unusual because the men were on one side of the room and the <laughs> women were on the other. So this is, this is my background. <laughs> you, you, you we wrote a Haggadah together. You have to, uh, because you're telling jokes, you have to tell the joke Roddy Dangerfield told you. <sighs> okay, I just have to say, we're in a band together. We're, and we'll get into the band a little bit, but we, we're not a good band. And sometimes, you know how other bands, when, when they finish one song, they go right into the next song? But we don't always know what the next song is <laughs> or how it goes. So there has to be some consultation. So we have Alan <laughs> tell <laughs> jokes. But he, yeah. we, so we were, did a show a couple of years ago in Arizona, and he told a joke. That, I, that made me laugh so hard that I, 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 I almost dropped my guitar, well, which would have been good for music, but... A little background. The first guy of any uh, import who had a specific persona that I wrote for, who weren't just Catskill Mountain joke tellers, was Rodney Dangerfield, because he had that thing, I don't get no respect. So it was easy for me to write for him and say, you know, in, even as an infant, I didn't get any respect. My mother wouldn't breastfeed me. She said she liked me as a friend. Okay, so <laughs> that was... So, so, <laughs> so I wrote for Rodney, and it was real easy. It was real easy. You know, no one in my family ever got any respect. During the Civil War, I had an uncle who fought for the West. Okay, <laughs> that was easy. So... <laughs> we became friends. And I'm writing Saturday Night Live, and I met my, my wife, Robin, who was uh, working on the show. We met, we uh, got married, and we had a honeymoon. And we came back, and it's 2 o'clock in the morning, and we're dead tired, and we had to go back. We had a show that week, and so the suitcases aren't even unpacked. We plop into bed, and 2 o'clock in the morning, and the phone rings. I go, hello? Alan, it's Rodney. I go, hey, man, what's doing? Alan, when we were growing up, we were real poor. I go, <laughs> how poor were you, Rodney? I said, when we, we were so poor that during Christmas, we couldn't afford tinsel for the tree. We used to wait for my grandfather to sneeze. <laughs> he requested it, OK? <laughs> I love that joke. Anyway. <laughs> so anyway. I'm just going to tell you a little about the remainders because um, we, none of those people have ever heard the remainders. No, yeah, some, okay, all right, all right. So we, we actually, yeah, we played in L.A. a few times. We played with Bruce Springsteen here one time. Um, but, I mean, one song. <laughs> Bruce came up. Um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a band of authors, uh, Stephen King, Amy Tan, Scott Turow, Mitch Album, Greg Isles, uh, James McBride, Roy Blunt Jr., Ridley Pearson, I don't know if I left anybody out. Mary Carr. Mary Carr. And um, so we have a lot of good authors in the band, uh, but we're not a good band, <laughs> musically. 
um, Roy Blunt describes our genre as hard listening music. <laughs> what I say is we, we play by what I call the rumor method <laughs> of music, which is everybody's playing something. And then a rumor goes around the band <laughs> that there might have been a chord change. <laughs> and then <laughs> we all switch uh, to a different chord, but not necessarily the same uh, different chord. So anyway, we've had a lot, lot, lots of uh, adventures. Alan joined us a few years ago and, and has fit right in in the sense that he has absolutely no musical talent whatsoever. <laughs> um, but I had one bad experience in the band that I, I want to tell you about. Um, uh, there are bands, we understand, who practice the songs ahead of time. <laughs> so that when they go to play, they know what they're going to be playing. That is not the approach that we take in the Rock Fire Remainers. We play the show, and then we go to a bar, and we say, we should have practiced those songs. <laughs> That's our... So anyway, we, we play a show in New York, and um, it went fine, and we went, we went to the hotel bar after and I'm sitting at the hotel bar next to Scott Tarot, who is a brilliant, funny, wonderful guy. And we're, we're sitting there, and everybody's talking. And he's talking to somebody next to me. I'm, and I, I, germane to the story, say I was drinking uh, a few vodka gimlets um, while this was happening. And Scott is telling a story to the person next to him, to his right, about his spleen. And I'm kind of halfway listening and drinking and talking to other people. And I hear him say something, and I ask him, wait a minute, do you, do you have your spleen or don't you? And he goes, no, I don't. That's the point of the story. It's like, oh, okay. And then, you know, you know I, and I kind of drift out of that conversation to some other one. Have maybe another gimlet or something. Then he says something that bothers me, and I, I interrupt him and say, excuse me, but I thought you said you don't have a spleen. And he goes, no, I don't have a spleen. I just told you that. That's the point of this, the story is I don't have a spleen. Okay, all right. All right. <laughs> well, I maybe had another gimlet or two. <laughs> and then I, one more, I hear him say something. It just didn't sound right. And I interrupt again and say, wait, you said you don't have a spleen. At this point, Scott takes a Sharpie <laughs> and pulls my sleeve up and writes, no spleen <laughs> on my right forearm in big letters. That solved the problem for the evening. Because I could just refer, you know. So then, we all go to bed, not together, we're not that kind of band. Wake up the next morning early, because we have to catch a plane, a train to Boston. And so I'm not in good shape. And I get up, and I'm staggering toward the bathroom. And I look in the mirror, and I see something's written on my arm. And I look down and it says, no spleen. And I have no idea how that got there. And you know how there's this urban legend <laughs> that a businessman is at a hotel bar and an attractive woman slips uh, something into his drink and he wakes up the next morning in the hotel bathtub packed in ice and there's a, a, and there's a note that says they've harvested his kidney. And for just a horrible couple of seconds there, I thought, they've harvested my spleen. <laughs> so I'm, I'm looking around, and I don't know where to look. I don't, <laughs> like most of you here, I don't really know where my spleen is, all right? And then, and I can't find an incision, and my brain starts to reboot, and I realize, you know, like, nobody would harvest your spleen. You, you don't need a spleen. That's why, that was the whole point of Scott's story. I mean, there's... <laughs> There's no market value to a spleen. Probably in organ harvesting circles, there's an expression, he's so dumb he'd harvest a spleen. Yeah, you know? sure. So I guess the moral of the story is uh, watch the gimlets. You know, I think if you're, anyway. I think there's a lesson to be learned. Yeah, yeah yes, indeed. But it, it's been fun. Play, you admit Stephen King, interesting, funny person. I'm looking forward to meeting him in Minneapolis. In a yeah, few weeks. We're, we're yeah. playing in a, in a couple weeks in Minneapolis. And uh, he is really brilliant guy who is the weirdest fans in the world. We were playing a, a show once in, in, in Nashville, and he, Stephen is singing something. And Ridley Pearson, our bass player, goes by me and says, check out the woman in front of Stephen. And I look over, and there's a woman in the audience like this. And all 10 of her fingernails are on fire. 
for real. Now, I'm assuming those are artificial fingernails, but I don't know that. This is a Stephen King fan, and maybe they can just do this, you know? <laughs> so Ridley goes by the other way and goes, I don't ever want to be that famous. You know? <laughs> But Alan, yes, sir. Tell me, how did you get started writing comedy? That was an excellent, excellent segue. Um, <laughs> look, it's sort of humbling in a way to me because it um, really it wasn't uh, my idea to become a comedy writer initially. This was a decision that was made for me about 40 years ago by every law school in the United States. <laughs> I went to college, I did fairly well, but they made you take the LSATs, the law boards, and I don't know how they grade them now, but back then they graded it from 200 to 800. If you can write your name, you got 200. If you were Einstein, you got 800. If you were Alan Zweibel, you got a 390 which reclassified me as, like, mineral right away. <laughs> and I remember going home and telling my Long Island Jewish parents that I got a um, 390 on the law boards. And about a week later, this is after they uncovered the mirrors, <laughs> they um, <laughs> got up off of those wooden boxes they had been sitting on. My dad gave me $1,000 which I then took and gave to a man named Stanley Kaplan. <coughs> you know him? For those of you who may not know, Stanley Kaplan's a man who's got these schools all over the country where they teach you how to take um, uh, you know, standardized tests. So I gave him $1,000, and for six months I studied because I wanted to retake the law boards. You know, I had the number two pencils, I had the earphones, and I was studying old tests, and I retook the law boards, and my score catapulted up to a 401. <laughs> which meant I'd be around 90 before I got into an English-speaking law school. <laughs> so I started writing jokes for those comedians. And that, that's how that happened. You could have, like today, you could have been on the USC sailing team. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, times have really changed. I, um, I started <laughs> writing jokes for those guys. And then um, after a while, I grew a little tired of it because uh, they were twice my age. I was 21, they were 45, and I was like writing for my parents, so I took the jokes they wouldn't buy from me, and I made it into a stand-up comedy act for myself. I went, there were two clubs in New York City at the time, this is the mid-70s. One was called The Improvisation, the other was called Catch a Rising Star, mm -hmm. and the plan was to go on stage and to tell my jokes with the hopes that like a manager or an agent would see me and want to represent me, and uh, the first week that I'm there, I met another guy who was just starting out named Billy Crystal. <laughs> and he lived about four towns away from my parents on Long Island, which is where I was living with my parents after college. And he would pick me up every night in his little blue Volkswagen. We'd go into the city, we would do our sets, and on the way back, we'd listen to the cassettes and criticize each other, and, and that we were friends. And one night, I'm about four months into this experiment of mine, and it's one o'clock in the morning, and I'm having the hardest time in the world making these four drunks from Des Moines laugh. <laughs> and I go to the bar, and I'm just hanging my head, and I'm waiting for Billy to get done so he can drive me home, when a guy comes and he sits next to me at the bar and just starts staring at me, and staring at me, and finally I go, what? What, 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 what do you want? He goes, you know, you're the worst comedian I've ever seen in my life. I said, well, I thanked him because I really needed to hear that right now, you know? And uh, he said, but your material's not bad. Did you write it? And I said, yeah. He said, well, I, can I see more of it? And I didn't even ask him who he was because at this point, they would have shown it to like a, a gardener, you know? And um, it ends up, this is Lorne Michaels. And he's gone from club to club in New York looking for writers and actors for this new show that he was gonna have starting in the fall called Saturday Night Live. So I go back to my parents' house and I stay at my mom and dad's kitchen table for two days straight, typing up what I believed were 1,100 of my best jokes. 
and these were the typewriters that had the keys that went like this, and they got like that, and you got all the ink, okay? It was all to do. Okay, two days later, I had to go back to the city for my meeting with Lauren, and I was really nervous. I didn't even know how to dress. I'm thinking, oh my God. Okay, young hip show, young hip producer. I'll dress young, I'll dress hip. I put on my father's maroon polyester leisure suit. <laughs> I looked like a big blood clot sitting on the Long Island Railroad. I went into the city. If memory serves, Lauren was staying at the plaza, and I, I had a two o'clock appointment, but like I said, I was nervous. I didn't want to be late, so I got there at seven in the morning. <laughs> and I'm in the lobby, and I go to a pay phone. No cell phones, 1975. I go to a pay phone, and I call Billy Crystal. He had been talking to Lauren about the possibility of he, Billy, being on this new show. Well, it didn't work out, but they had spent time together. They had... Um, had dinner, they talked comedy, they went for walks, and I said, listen, I have a meeting with this guy, Lorne. What should I know about him to give me a leg up in this meeting? He said, well, he used to write for Woody Allen. He's produced Monty Python specials. Oh, and he hates mimes. Lorne hates mimes. I went, okay, got it. All right, I go up at 2 o'clock. I sit on the edge of Lorne's bed. He pulls up a chair. I hand him this volume of 1,100 jokes. He opens it, he reads the first joke, he goes, uh-huh. Then he closes the book. I'm up for two days straight, typing 1,100 <laughs> jokes. He reads one joke, and to show you how long ago this was, from the reference points in it, I had written a joke saying that the post office was about to issue a stamp commemorating prostitution in the United States. 10 cent stamp, if you want to lick it, it's a quarter, okay? <laughs> he said, good, very good. He said, um, how much money do you need to live on? So I said, well, I'm making $2.75 an hour at the deli, because I was working at a deli at the time. I said, match it. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, well, tell me a little bit more about yourself, which I took to mean that before he committed to this kind of cash, he wanted to see what he was buying. I said, well, Woody Allen's my idol. Love Monty Python. But if there's one fucking mime on this show, I am out of here. <laughs> and he gave me a job, so that's how that happened. <laughs> Well, I, well, I think we're getting uh, close to the time when we're supposed to take questions. But well, well, no, no, before, before we, we do, do that, I want to talk about your book, the reason we're here. Well, that's why I was going to say we have something to we can read from. Well, we place. do have something. I read this book, Dave's new book, and I think you guys got it, or a lot of you got it. And I read it on an airplane um, last week. And um, as a friend of Dave's and a, a fan of his, uh, this book is great. It's not only really fun Dave Barry stuff, but there's a, a philosophy in here, and um, the last chapter, which, well, which I'm going to let you talk about, is, um, is quite uh, profound. It's got a lot of pathos. It's about his daughter. And um, uh, tell us about this book, you know, wh why you wrote it and how it all came about. Well, I'll tell real quickly. I'm, I turned 70 last year, and my dog turned 10. Dog Lucy turned 10, so 70 in dog years. And I realized that she was... Uh, doing better than I was, and <laughs> aging. And so the premise of the book is, uh, what is, what does Lucy do that I could do except for drink from the toilet? Um, <laughs> that makes her happy. So um, that was the idea behind the book. It's meant to be a humor book, but it's, I mean, it's, it's kind of a departure for me. It's almost a little bit of a self-help book, which is really unusual for me. Usually when people finish my books, they go, that didn't help me at all. <laughs> um, <laughs> I actually feel stupider now, having read, <laughs> read that book. But anyway, um, we want to read you one thing from it, um, because Ted requested that we do this. Um, one of the lessons, they're just little simple things, and everything in the book, is, everybody already knows, the, the, my premise is that it's not that dogs are smart, it's just that they're 
wise. They, they keep doing things that make them happy, and people don't. People forget simple, obvious things like pay attention to the people you love and that kind of thing. But anyway, one of the, one of the lessons is uh, let go of your anger. Um, and I am bad at this. Um, Lucy's really good at it. When, when uh, She has a window in our office that looks out on the driveway, and she keeps, you know, sits there all day and keeps track of things. And like every day, every, not every day, once a week, men come and take our garbage. And Lucy really can't believe we let that happen. She is <laughs> barking really angrily. And like, are you just going to, you know. But as soon as they're gone, she's going to lie down and resume farting. She's fine, you know. <laughs> She doesn't wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and go, I can't believe we let them take the garbage again. Man. Whereas we do that. People, people do that. Um, and uh, so the, I give an example in the book of the kind of thing that irritates me more than it probably should. And what happened was, um, I, do you have Comcast out here? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, I have Comcast, and one day the, the guy who comes once a week and it hacks away at our yard accidentally cut the cable, both Comcast and AT&T, leading into our house. So all the cables, they were just dangling from the pole. And he came and told me and apologized, and I said, don't worry. And I got on the cell phone and called AT&T and said, the cable's been cut. And they said, oh, okay, we'll send the truck out. And they did right away, and it fixed it, no problem. Then I called, uh, a, I called Comcast customer service, which is in like Af Uz Uzbekistan or some place. <laughs> I don't know where it is. And I got a guy who had his script, um, and I said, you know, the yard guy cut the, the Comcast cable, so you need to fix it. And he goes, "Oh, David, I'm sorry, David. You know, they say your name a lot. Yeah. Um, David, we will, I'm sorry your cable's not working. We will res work to resolve your problem, David." Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And then he says, uh, David, can you tell me, are all your cable boxes turned on? <laughs> it's like right away I know he's, he's got the wrong script. And I'm trying, I'm not a you know, physicist, but I'm just trying to explain that the cable, the TV shows are falling onto the lawn. And they can't. <laughs> they have no way to get into the house right now. And that's what they need to fix. Yep not the box. And, and I explain that again pretty, pretty carefully. I'm, a, you know, an English major, professional. I very clearly told him what, I see, David. David, can you tell me the serial number of the main? So at some point, I lost it. And the, the truth is, I mean, I was angry for a bit. It's not worth it. You know, the poor guy, it's not his fault. Um, and eventually got resolved. And he, Anyway, so the way I dealt with that, the way I dealt with that kind of anger is um, I wrote uh, about it. And in this book, I wrote a little script, which is a revenge script <laughs> against the Comcast customer service policy. So why don't we, we have to stand up. So um, you're going to be the customer service representative. You, you be the red. Oh, so there's black and there's red. You'll be the black, I'll be the red. So he, he's a natural. <laughs> okay. <clears throat> I have a fantasy. In this fantasy, late one night, a cable executive calls 911, only to discover that as a cost-cutting measure, the police department has outsourced its 911 operation to the cable company. Thank you for choosing 911. What is your emergency? A man broke into my house. He has an ax. May I have your name and address? Bob Timmons, 123 Beltswater Road. Please hurry. Thank you, Bob. Now, Bob, I understand you were uh, saying that uh, you have an axe, you have an intruder in your house? Yes, with an axe. Please send somebody. Bob, I am sorry that an intruder with an axe is in your house, <laughs> and I will help you to resolve this problem. Please hurry. He's coming up the stairs. Now, Bob, in order to assist you, I am going to need to ask you some questions. Is that okay, Bob? Yes, just hurry. Okay, Bob, first, can you tell me did you give permission for this intruder to enter your house, Bob? No, for God's sake, he, has, he broke in with an ax. Thank you. Now, Bob, I understand you were saying that the intruder does not have your permission to be in your house, 
at 123 Elkwater Road. Is that correct? No, I'm at 123 Belchwater Road. Oh, so Bob, you're saying that you were at 123 Belchwater Road. Yes! But the intruder is at 123 Elkwater Road. Bob? <laughs> no, he's here. He's breaking down the bedroom door. For the love of God, send help. Bob, so then I can better assist you. Can you please describe the axe? <laughs> On the executive's end of the line, there are shouts, sounds of a struggle, screams, then silence. A new voice comes on the line. Who is this? This is 911. Is this Bob? No. Do you have an emergency? Not anymore. <laughs> so the problem you had was resolved? Yes. Would you be willing to take a brief customer satisfaction, <laughs> sir? Anyway. Uh, okay. So, we've covered pretty much everything. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions or problems at home you would like to share with the group? <laughs> So, uh, for the Q&A part of the evening, just a quick reminder that questions around here generally start with a W or an H, sometimes a D. There is no such thing as a two-part question, and tonight only Alan Zweibel gets to ask follow-up questions. With those rules in place, who would like to go first? Anyone here? Hi. Um, first of all, Dave Barry, it is... Uh, Amazing to see you. I've read you since I was a little kid in the newspapers. Anyway, I was just curious. You asked Alan how he got his start. I was curious as to how you got your start. Um, well, I'll skip. I mean, I wrote, liked to write humor when I was a kid. I wrote uh, humor columns for my high school paper and for my college paper. Uh, one of the great humiliations of my life is I went back for one of my college reunions. I went to Haverford College, Haverford, mm -hmm. Pennsylvania. Our motto is, we never heard of you either. Uh, and I went back and somebody, this is after I had become a syndicated humor columnist, and somebody had blown up a bunch of my college, you know, um, columns, put them all around the gym where the dance was. So I'm reading these columns that I wrote in the 60s, and I don't get any of the jokes at all. And so, but anyway, I, I, I went to work for a little newspaper, and whenever I could, I wrote humor columns. Um, and then I, I just kept writing columns. I wasn't getting you know, a lot of money for it. I was doing other things for a living, but I kept writing this column. The big break came uh, when my son was born in 1980. And uh, back then, we had a system we called natural childbirth, which was a brand new thing that boomers invented. Prior to that, I mean, like the system I was born under, Alan was born under, um, the mother was given drugs and didn't wake up till the child was like in third grade. Uh, and the father was in another room smoking cigarettes. So only people who actually witnessed the birth of the child were professionals being paid for it and wearing masks. Um, and so the boomers, code, we had to reinvent everything, and we invented childhood birth, and it was going to be natural, and there was going to be no uh, drugs, and they, we had classes, um, classes to have a baby. And they would, you know, you'd sit with other boomers, and um, they would pass around, like, plastic models of the cervix for you to admire, like, and you don't know where that thing has been, you know? Uh, And then they would teach the women this secret breathing technique to deal with the contractions. They never used the word pain. Never. It's like talking about the Pacific Ocean and not mentioning water. <laughs> and um, so we, you know, and then you were supposed to have certain breathing, and that's how you're going to de deal with the contractions. And, and so, that, you know, and it sounds great. And then you get into the actual moment of childbirth, and all the women are going, ah! You know, it's like, None of it is working at all. They all just want, they're screaming for drugs. Um, so I wrote an essay about that, kind of mocking the whole natural childbirth thing, at a time when 
every newspaper editor in America was roughly my age and having babies. And so they, a whole lot of them ran that column, and that's really what got me, me started. Um, and then from then on, I was on much more, much more papers. And what I, the, the interesting financial discovery I had was I wrote this essay for the Philadelphia Inquirer, and they paid me $350, which is the most money I'd ever made for writing anything. And I was really thrilled. And then I got a call from the uh, editor, an editor of the Sunday magazine, the Chicago Tribune, saying, I saw your piece about childbirth. I thought it was really great. I'd like to run it in the Chicago Tribune. How much do you charge? And I'm thinking, well, I already got $350, which is more than I write. I said, well, well, how about $50? <laughs> and he goes, well, we'll pay you $500. <laughs> I, sh I should have said $25. He might have gone up to yeah. like a thousand. <laughs> But that was the discovery I made that you could write something then be paid by more than one newspaper for it, which was sort of the beginning of, that's how I really got going. And then this was, I'm in my 30s at this point, but that was when I began to realize that I maybe could just do that for a living. So, wow. Yeah. And then I met Lauren Green, Lauren um, Michaels. <laughs> Lauren Green. <laughs> uh, on this, you played Haas. I was in <laughs> I was, I was on the set of Bonanza trying to sell jokes. Oh, geez. <laughs> it's weird that a Chicago paper was a boon for you. Why is that? Because for me, it was the exact opposite. Exact opposite. I um, had written this movie. Oh. <laughs> Good segue. Yeah. <laughs> no, you'll see it. It Ooh. ties together beautifully. <laughs> I just caught it. Yeah. yeah, whoa. I had written this movie. Um, uh, our son, uh, Adam, was about seven years old. And he was um, at that age where at dinner, he would look at me and my wife, Robin. And you can tell from the expression on his face that the kid was thinking, uh, I, I can do better than these two, you know? <laughs> so I wrote a book called North, about a little boy named North, who didn't feel appreciated by his parents, declared himself a free agent, and went all over the world, offering his services as a devoted son to the highest bidding sets of parents. Book did OK, just OK. But I had sent it to Rob Reiner for a blurb for the book cover. He had hosted the third Saturday Night Live ever. Rob read it. He called me, he said, you know, I'm a director now. Or, no shit, he had done, when Harry met Sally, you know, Few Good Men, Spinal Tap, he said, let's do this as a movie. So this is a dream to a writer, to write a book and to be hired to write the screenplay for it. And my family was out here, me and Robin and, and uh, uh, the three kids, and uh, I wrote the screenplay and um, Rob directed it and it was a, uh, $50 million movie, and it had Jason Alexander, Julia Louis-Dreyfus, Bruce Willis, um, Elijah Wood, a little eight-year-old actress that was her first role named Scarlett Johansson was in it. And I flew my parents out from Florida. There were two less Jews in Boca that night. They were out, <laughs> they were out here. And it was the greatest night of my life until the next morning when the reviews came out. Now, Chicago Sun-Times, right? The Tri Chicago Tribune. For those of you who don't remember Roger Ebert's review of oh. North. <laughs> or carry it with you. I hated this movie. Hated, hated, hated. Hated, hated, hated this movie. Hated it. <laughs> hated every simpering, stupid moment, audience insulting moment of it. Hated the sensibility that thought that anyone would like it. Hated the implied insult to the audience and its belief that anyone would actually be entertained by it. Now, on the surface, <laughs> This may seem like a, you know, not such a great review, but um, 
if you read it again, I think he sort of liked it. And so that was the Chicago connection over here. And it was terrible, because we were living out here at the time. We live in Jersey now, because Robin and I sat down one day and said, you know, we're not paying enough money in property taxes, so we should um, <laughs> move back east. But we were living out here, and Robin could, you know, she'd go to San Vicente, the Vicente Foods in Brentwood, and other housewives would say things about the movie and about the reviews. Our son Adam went to Crossroads, okay, and uh, the kids would taunt him. He would come home and say, Dad, can we change our last name to Sorkin, you know? <laughs> So that's the Chicago connection. Nice. <laughs> this is such a fun evening. I'm really having a great time. Um, I'm wondering when the Rock Bottom Remainders are coming back to LA. Um, Ted? I didn't plant that. This is our manager right here. Ted, Ted is the manager of the Rock Bottom Remainders. Next he, question. He determines. <laughs> what, can I tell about, can I tell about when we played here and Bruce Springsteen was with us, sure. we, we, uh, we, didn't, we didn't know he was going to be performing with us, but somebody in the band was, had some connection with him. And um, so from the very end of the night, he gets on the stage with us, and we had only one song left. We don't have that many to begin with. <laughs> and our only song left was Gloria, you know, G-L-O-R-I, which is a very simple song. If you take a guitar and throw it on the ground, <laughs> it will play Gloria. And, and I had to ask Bruce Springsteen, Bruce, do you know Gloria? And he, <laughs> he said, I think I can handle it. And he did. He did fine. But the only reason he's not in the band is he hadn't written a book at that time. You know, so we can't, you know, we got to lower our standards. <laughs> what? He said, yeah, afterward, like when people figured out it was Bruce Springsteen, it took us like three hours to get out of there. <laughs> we were stuck in this room while they tried to disperse the crowd. And we're all back there, and he's very nice to us, and he said, somebody at some point got enough courage to ask him, well, what did you think of our band? And he goes, well, you're not bad, but don't get any better, you'd just be another shitty band. <laughs> <laughs> Wait a second, so we had to get better to, to get be shitty. shitty. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. <laughs> a lot so, better. Yeah. Nancy Reardon told me a story of when you and Ridley were staying at their house during the Democratic Convention and that you and Ridley evidently had gone off as Richard's security detail. Oh, I, I know what you're talking about. And I have, I have, it's been a long time since I, I've heard the story, I can, and I'd I love to you, hear I it from you. I know exactly what the story is about. Okay, you used to, you used to have a mayor here named of Dick Reardon, recall? Ted was involved in this. I was running for president at the time, as I still am. Um, I mean, who's not, you know? <laughs> Show of hands, who's not seeking the Democratic <laughs> nomination? <laughs> Ted arranged to have Dick Reardon, and I just want to say this for the record, is insane. I mean, in a good way, but the man is insane. He, he said, Ted arranged to have Dick uh, endorse me for president of the United States. And he set up a meeting at the pantry, which is a, are you familiar with the pantry? Yeah. You, rest, you walk by it and you get heart disease, right? <laughs> it's his diner, like, so... We knew that Dick was going to be there with his people and his security. So we, Ted, this was Ted's idea. We decided I should have my people in my security. So I gathered together the cartoonists who were there to cover. This was the, the Democratic convention that was here. And I can't remember what year, but um, political cartoonists who are also crazy. And what we did, we all got suits and sunglasses. And they wore, they took their, uh, you know that coily wire on your phone in the hotel? It goes to the earpiece. They got that, and they put one in here, and the other end they stuck in there. Here. So we all go down. It's just, there's a sit down. My people are behind me. Dick's people are behind him. He endorses me. It's very formal. It's very good. But he lets slip that he's going to a party that night. Now, do you, you, you have to understand, when you go to political conventions, I go to every one. The lowest form of life at political convention is delegates. Okay? Nobody gives them any respect. Their, their job is to hold the signs, and people tell them what the signs should say and everything. Meanwhile, there's, there's all this other stuff going on, a lot of money, a lot of, a lot of power, and there's parties. There's big parties at night, and the, the goal of everybody is to get invited to these parties. And Dick lets slip that he's going to, do you remember the name of the 
Uh, the lobby firm patent box. Patent box. Okay, lobby firm. This is the most exclusive party that's going to be held in LA at this convention. Everybody's going to be there. The, you know, all the, the top politicians, movie stars, everybody's going to be there. Dick lets slip that he's going there because he's the mayor. And, and we say to Dick, could we be your security? <laughs> and he goes, because he's insane, sure. <laughs> so we all, for, we all gave, we gave ourselves secret code names. Um, m- mine was Agent Orange. What was yours? <laughs> Kitchen Magician. Kitchen Magician. <laughs> So we, we get there, and we don't have actual radio communication. We just have these phone cords from our hotel room. <laughs> but we're still pretending we can talk to each other. We get there at the patent box thing, and there is a lot of security there. And we get there before the mayor. And we're like gathered, and we are like cartoonist Ted and me with these things. And we're wearing sunglasses, and it's nighttime. <laughs> so they're, they're very suspicious of us. And then up comes the mayor and his wife, who we had called, um, I believe we called him... Um, Lamb chop. Lamb chop. <laughs> and his wife was some kind of... Was sourdough. Sourdough. <laughs> so we're like, we have, we have lamb chop, we have sourdough. And we are approaching, and the, look, the security people who are real big-time security, you would not believe who was at this party, are very concerned as we approach. And Dick Reardon goes, they're with me. <laughs> and so... In we all go, and then that was, where it got really good was when we got inside, because we wanted to go to the bar. So we, we, all these people like the, you know, like the ambassador from Spain and whatever, are coming over, they want to meet the mayor, say, sorry, we have the mayor has to go to the bar. And we kind of <laughs> shove them over to the bar, and we wouldn't let anybody near them, because we were security, you know. So after a while, it just became us drinking, um, and... There was a wonderful moment, uh, a, a, one of the cartoonists, a uh, fellow by the name of Chip Bach, a very good cartoonist, was by the bar, and he'd had n- numerous drinks, and um, his, his earpiece had fallen out, so <laughs> it's just, it just like a cord coming out of his ear. And I watched this wonderful scene, that I could only could have it on video. He's there, and this just, just absolutely gorgeous Los Angeles woman comes walking up, and Chip sees her, and he's going to make this move, you know, but he completely missed the bar. <laughs> so his head bangs on the thing, and his, his cord is swinging, and, and a gorgeous Los Angeles woman turned and walked away quickly. Right there. But it was a fun night, and doggone it. Like, who has, you didn't really... And, and that's when Dick Reardon said... I'm going over to Schwarzenegger's house for a party, but I don't think I can take you guys. <laughs> that was a wonderful night. Uh, I, uh, um, I haven't finished the book yet, so you may have covered this in the end, but um, uh, obviously Lucy is getting on, and do you feel that uh, after she uh, goes to the great kennel in the sky, do you feel like you'll start over with another dog, or, yes. or do like my mother has done and adopt an older one? <laughs> oh, I see. No, let's start with the younger dog because he's going to have the dog around longer, you know. In fact, I'm trying to get an interim dog, but I'm losing that battle. You know, a transition dog. Uh, hey, Mr. Barry. Um, you guys have uh, told some of your uh, tales dealing with uh, network execs and studio execs. And I was just wondering if you had any uh, of those stories when you were doing the, uh, the Dave's World TV show. <laughs> um, not really. I, I was not very involved, and I had total creative control over what I did with the check they sent me. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I really didn't, um, I didn't have a lot to do with the show. I was on it once. They, they, the, during the first season, they flew me out there uh, and, and had me play a, a, a cameo role with Harry Anderson, who's, who was mm-hmm. playing me. And, um, and the, the role was, I was trying to, to this is based on an actual column I wrote, Harry Anderson and I were both trying to buy the same air. There's one air conditioner left during a heat wave, and we're both trying to buy it. That's the scene. And like my, I had like just a very few lines. The first line was, I need an air conditioner. Um, and so I'm practicing on the plane out there. You know, I, I need an air conditioner. I need an air conditioner. I need an air conditioner. You know, I was like playing with it, you know. 
So I get there. What I didn't realize, on a, the sound stage, I'd never been on one. And there's was all these people. I didn't realize there was going to be that many people. All these lights. It came, but there were marks on the floor, you know? And it would be like a yellow one, a yellow two, a yellow three, a green one, a green two. And you were supposed to, if you were yellow, give your first line on the one, your second. You know this? I didn't know. I didn't know any of this. Yeah, yeah. So... <laughs> Here's tape All right, here. Right. So, tape. so the first 83 takes are, are like this. I need, because, you know, I was very bad at it, is what I'm trying to, And they all could just do it. They never looked down. I don't know how they do it. They must have, like, eyeballs in their feet or something. But that was my experience with it. You want to try live television, okay? Because there, you, you can do that little walk you just did, you can do it over and over again. On live TV, once it's said, it, it's out there. You, you can't bring it back. And when I was doing SNL, that was the most trying, it was the most fun stuff because it was a high wire act. I mean, there was, um, there was one night when Gilda and I was a Friday night, it was around two o'clock in the morning, and we were going with legal pads to write created this character for called Roseanne Rose. And we went to, we were going to a Japanese restaurant that was near 30 Rock that was open until, oh, like four in the morning just to write this piece. And as we're walking, I see, um, we pass a newsstand that's got uh, a pile of tomorrow's newspapers. And the headline is, Mr. Ed dies. <laughs> okay, you know, big, big news day, you know. Uh, <laughs> The talking horse from TV dies. So I go to a pay phone, and I call Lauren. I said, look, it's Wybell. I got bad news for you. <laughs> said, Mr. Ed died. He said, Alan, it's 2 o'clock in the morning. There better be more to this than that. So I said, well, what if on tonight's show, we interview Mrs. Ed? <laughs> widow, okay? <laughs> so he says, you find a horse and we'll do it. So it's now 2.15 in the morning and I'm a Jew in New York looking for a horse. <laughs> so I call up the prop guy, a Gentile. I say, it's Wybell. I need a horse for the show. He goes, what kind? <laughs> Kind. I said, you know, a horse, four legs, a tail, teeth. Female. A, a regulation horse. <laughs> he says, Alan, look, there's Pintos, there's Mustangs, there's Clydesdales. What kind of horse do you want? So I said, um, picture Mr. Ed. <laughs> Who would he choose for a bride? Okay. <laughs> Get me that horse. Okay. Yeah. So I, wake, I go to sleep, I wake up, brush my teeth, I shower, I go, go to the studio, it's 8 o'clock in the morning, Saturday morning, and there's a horse there. Okay, so I write a piece where Bill Murray, who is now the anchor man on Weekend Update, and Gilda was going to play the voice of Mrs. Ed, okay? And how they do it is they um, put molasses on the horse's lips. I would go, horse, try to lick it off. <laughs> And Gilda, who's in Don Pardo's booth, would say the words as Mrs. Ed. So we try it in dress rehearsal, okay? And it was adorable because we put a black hat and a veil on the horse, okay? <laughs> the horse is coming back from the funeral, uh, supposedly, and Bill Murray says, uh, did he suffer much? And Gilda had the horse say, no, he died peacefully. Oh. We went, okay, this could work on TV. I have no idea what happened to this horse between dress rehearsal <laughs> and when it was on live TV. But the minute the horse saw the red light on the camera, oh. he flipped out. And he started running in circles. <laughs> and we had no script for it. Yeah. And Gilda, improv, right, goes, oh, I'm so upset I'm chasing my tail, Bill. <laughs> Then at one point, the horse breaks rank, 
leaves the studio, goes running down a hall of NBC. Lauren says to a cameraman, follow that horse. <laughs> and Gilda says, oh, I'm so upset, I'm gonna throw myself out a window, girl. <laughs> so don't tell me about tape on the floor, okay? <laughs> Dave, would you talk about the last chapter in the book? You, know, you want to bring everybody down, do you? <laughs> um, so I, I wrote this book, and it's meant to be a humor book. It's, uh, I hope it's funny. But it was, you know, I had lessons. And uh, I finished the book last year, and I was supposed to go on book tour last fall. And uh, in August, August 18th, um, my daughter, Sophie, who was about to start her freshman year at Duke, um, two days before she was supposed to leave, we were supposed to take her up, uh, she woke up paralyzed. Oh. And um, it turns out she had an autoimmune disorder, a, a severe, rare uh, autoimmune disorder called uh, transverse myelitis, where your immune system attacks your spinal cord. And um, the prognosis was they didn't know, but a lot of people don't recover from it, and that's all we knew. And so... Um, from the next few weeks, I didn't think I was ever going to write any humor again. I didn't think I was going to do anything again except take care of my daughter. And it just, you know, felt like our life were, it was over the way it had been and it was going to be a different life, and that was that. Um, she got better. I want to stress that. She is now at Duke, and she's happy and doing well. Thank you. Thank you. But it, it, was, um, it was a really... Um, this is an overused phrase, but it was a life-changing experience. And I called my editor at uh, Simon & Schuster, uh, uh, Priscilla Payton, and said, I can't go around talking about a book um, about life lessons when I, without talking about this. It was the biggest lesson I've, I learned. So the last chapter of the book is very different from the rest of the book. It's about that, that experience. And it's not a downer. Um, I mean, it came out okay for Sophie. And it, it, it was just... Uh, a very powerful experience for all of us. And it changed us, changed me. So anyway, that's what it's about. Not very funny, <laughs> but that's what the last chapter is about. No, but it, while it's not funny, it's incredibly uh, uplifting and um, it's infused with all sorts of um, hope and love. And I know it's a different turn for you to take, but um, like I said, I read it on a plane and I started crying, one, because you had called Michelle, your wife, and she was gleeful. She said, Sophie moved her leg this morning. Okay, and that little sentence meant that there was hope and that things were taking a turn. And um, so that last chapter is, and I, I noticed the change in you too, and um, it's, it's great. It had a great ending. So I'm sorry you went through it, but I'm glad it ended the way that it did. Let's do one more question. My son and I used to love your um, your mockery of uh, pol political things and and, um, and environmental stuff. And um, are you going to do that again? <laughs> <laughs> well, every year I write a year in review that runs in the Washington Post and the Miami Herald, a bunch of other papers. And that's when I talk mostly about politics. Um, this year I'll probably go, I ever do every year. Actually, it'll be the end of the year. It'll be in early 2020. I'll go to Iowa and New Hampshire. I usually do. They're very entertaining. They're even normal times this time. Whoa. Um, and then I go to both political conventions usually. So as far as I can tell, there's the main function of the way we elect the President of the United States is to give me material. Um, <laughs> So yeah, I, I plan to do that. But I, I mean, I don't, I don't write a weekly column anymore, so I don't, don't do it then. Yeah. Well, with that, thank you, Alan. Thanks, Dave. Thank you.